So atomic emission spectroscopy is uh, kind of a general sort of area where we analyse the different uh, the different colours of light that get emitted when we heat or burn a, uh, a a sample of metal. Now the most primitive or sort of basic form of atomic emission spectroscopy is just the good old fashioned flame test. Now the idea behind the flame test is that we know that if we heat if we heat the atom of an element, then its electrons will get excited, and as they de-excite, different colours will be emitted depending on what atom we're looking at. Now, if we, when we're dealing with the flame test, we, we are we're using heat to excite the atom. And what we can do is, let's say we've got you know a solution of, uh, you know maybe a sodium solution, and we spray that. It's a dodgy little spray bottle there. We spray that into a flame, then the flame might turn a certain colour. So, you know, if we've got sodium solution, then the flame will turn yellow. Basically, all that, all the, the only reason that happens is that as the sodium ions get, sodium atoms get heated, they get excited, and then their electro, as their electrons move from their higher energy levels back to the ground state, uh, they emit light in this case in the case of sodium yellow light turning the flame yellow now if we sprayed a different solution then you know we could get the flame turning maybe a bit purpley or something like that and so these the color the flame turns is sort of signature or is sort of unique to uh, the element that we're spraying into the flame and so this can be used as a way to identify uh, a, a certain metal. We can we can put a bit of metal in a flame. We can heat a bit of a metal and see what color uh, we get, and that can be used to help us identify what the metal is. Now, this is kind of a pretty good test, a pretty easy test to conduct. However, it does have some weaknesses. First of all, we know that when we are when we excite an atom and then it is de-excited and emits light, it emits lots of different specific frequencies, sort of a little bit like this here. We've got, you see, three different frequencies of light that are sort of red, a reddy pinky colour, and then, you know, a few different specific frequencies are up in the bluey, purpley end of the spectrum. Now, in the flame test, the colour that the flame goes will be a mixture of all these different frequencies of light, and so that means that it is less of it can be at, at times less obvious and harder to distinguish between different colors. So we might have, you know, two different metals that sh sort of one turns a, a dark red and one turn maybe a bit, a bit like this, and maybe one turns you know a slightly different red, a little bit like this, and you know it can be very difficult for us to analyze small differences in color like that, and it's it, it is sort of less obvious to us. Uh, what metal is, what what colour it's turning, or what metal we're dealing with. Another weakness is that sometimes, you know, the flame, a, merely a simple flame like this, just isn't hot enough to excite uh, the atom that we're looking at. So, two ways that we can improve this process as a result of that is to, if we make the flame hotter, then we'll be at it we'll be able to excite a, a larger range of elements and thus we'll be able to, we'll be able to identify uh, more, more different elements. Now the second way we can improve this is using a prism to break up colours. So we know, as I said, uh, the colour of the flame is a mixture of all the different colours of light emitted by the atom as it is de-excited. However, if we use a prism to break it up, so instead of having this uh, maybe this purple colour flame, we can break it up into something a little bit more like this, then we can see the individual wavelengths that are being emitted by the atom, and as a result, it can be uh, a lot easier for us to identify that. So by making these two improvements, we come up with a process called atomic emission spectroscopy. Now, atomic emission spectroscopy is basically a setup a little bit like the one I've drawn here. So, you know, we've got a flame here, however, we, we try and make the flame a bit hotter. Maybe we don't use just a basic Bunsen burner, maybe we use a more sophisticated piece of heating technology. But what we get is basically we get this, uh, say, say, the, say the flame's turning purple, we get this purple flame, and then we shine the light through a slit like this, just so we get a single narrow, narrow, narrow uh, column or beam of light, so we just make it nice and narrow. And then we send this beam through 
a prism. Now, by setting it through a prism, uh, the different colors, the different individual frequencies that make up this uh, this flame color are going to get broken up. So we might have, you know, some red and some yellow and maybe some blue. They're going to diffract by different amounts. And that way, if by doing that, we can get an emission spectrum that looks something a little bit like that. And so by breaking up the colors, rather than just having a, you know, two different maybe two elements will produce a completely different looking spectrums here, but they may produce the same color flame when the colors in that spectrum are mixed together. So by breaking them up, we can see more clearly and more specifically what atom we're dealing with. It's, uh, it's more, uh, this, uh, this emission spectrum is more unique to, uh, to a given element than just this, this flame color, which can be hard to distinguish sometimes. So uh, atomic emission spectroscopy is therefore a form of qualitative analysis in that it allows us to identify the types of substances that we're dealing with rather than we're not figuring out any amounts or concentrations we're just figuring out what it is that we're looking at. Another point to know about atomic emission spectroscopy is that although when atoms are de-excited they can emit all different types of uh, electromagnetic radiation Atomic emission spectroscopy in this form only deals with visible light. Although we're putting the, the light, the, the emissions from the atom through a prism to see all the different colors, we're still only seeing the visible colors. We're not seeing UV light or infrared or anything like that. So we're only looking at visible light. So now, so as, as I've said, uh, by, we can break up break up the color of the flame into its individual components to more readily identify the element that we're dealing with. However, um, so and why why is this a fingerprint? Why is this so unique? Well, we know that we've got the nucleus. If we have a nucleus like this, we have a nucleus like that with its electron shells. Now, well, atoms of different elements are going to have different numbers of protons in their nucleus, and that means the electrons surrounding that nucleus will have differing levels of attraction for the nucleus. And that is why the energy shells in, a di in different elements have different energies. Now, it's these different energies that mean the jumps between electron shells in different atoms uh, are, are by different amounts. And, and that means that we have different uh, colors of light being emitted by different atoms as they're de-excited. That makes this spectrum analogous to a fingerprint for a given element makes it unique and very specific and allows us to identify an element based purely on the colors of light that it emits. Now, why are these lines so narrow on the emission spectrum? Well, we know that when, when the electron is jumping from maybe say the second shell to the inner shell, it's jumping from a very specific energy level to another very specific energy level. That means the ray of light that is reduced in this, that is released in this process, has to, is cor has to contain a very specific amount of energy, uh, namely the amount, the difference in energies between the second and first shell. And so, because this is such a specific energy that this has to, this uh, this photon or this piece of light has to contain, it means it's a very specific frequency. And so, this frequency is only going to show up if we're dealing with one very specific frequency. It's going to show up as a very thin line on this continuous spectrum of frequencies. Uh, that is given by the visible light spectrum and that is why we have a very thin line on the spectrum. Now how can we use this to uh, to identify elements? Well it's it's obviously pretty straightforward we just uh, we run a uh, we do some spectroscopy we, we we heat or excite our atom and we look at the colors that are released and we compare it to the known the known or sort of colors of light that are going to be emitted by elements. So here we've got you know, we can see the spectrum of sodium contains just two, two yellow lines here. The spectrum of calcium looks a bit like this, and the spectrum of potassium looks a bit like this. And so we can look at these sort of standard results and data to compare what we get here to uh, the known results and see what, what metal it is that we're spraying in the flame over here. So it's obviously pretty straightforward to help us identify, but let's say, for example, that we've got some combination of metals up here in the... Uh, in the, that we're putting into the flame that we're exciting. So let's say we've got a combination of metal, metals. We put it through, we do some spectroscopy, and we get a spectrum. And uh, we'll say it's a very impure sample. And for that reason, we get sort of, it's a bit rough. It's not going to look exactly like 
anything here. So we might have a bit of a, a bit of a fuzzy ready ready patch there. Another yellow patch here. And then some uh, some blue up here and some purple. So it looks roughly like this, and it's very rough because of the uh, the impure nature of this sample. It's a bit more, it's a bit a uh, bit less clear, perhaps because there there's a few other elements in there. But mainly, the sample consists of of, uh, of of several metals. So we want to identify what these metals are. Well, if we look over here, we can see we've got the spectrums for sodium, potassium, and calcium, respectively. We want to figure out how these are uh, these different. Uh, elements could possibly combine to produce a spectrum. So if we have a sample containing sodium and calcium, then we can basically add their spectrums together and we'll get something that looks like that right here. And so it's basically just addition of the different colors that come up in the spectrum of an individual element uh, to show us how, how, how two different elements together will look. So I've got something that looks a little bit like this. So we can see that calcium and potassium both have they, calcium has some pink, which we see over here. They both have some blue and some purple, which we see over here. And potassium has some yellow, which we see over here. So seemingly, calcium and potassium could be making up this mixture here. Similarly, if we are, calcium has some pink and, and blue, blue and purple, whereas sodium could be providing the yellow that we're seeing over here. So at the moment, it seems that both that the mixture could, could contain either calcium and sodium, calcium and potassium, or, cal or all three. So how can we know which is which? And now, obviously, we're presuming here that the only metals contained in the, in the sample up here are calcium, sodium, or potassium. Now, as you'll see over here, you may have already noticed that there, is, there are a few green lines in the potassium spectrum. Now, as I said, if we're, if we're conducting some spectroscopy on a mixture of different elements, then all of the colors produced by each of those elements should be present in this resultant spectrum. However, as you can see, there's a, green, there's a few green lines, spectral lines in the potassium spectrum, and none over here. Now, what that tells us is, if potassium were contained in the mixture, then we would have some green lines there, inevitably, because potassium will produce those green lines. However, we don't have those lines, which tells us that the sample that was used to create this spectrum was simply, con simply contained calcium and sodium and no potassium because of this absence of green lines and so that's how we can sort of use uh, combinations of, of data regarding the spectrums of different elements to really analyze a, either a combination of uh, a combination of metals as we did here or in an even simpler and more straightforward way we can analyze individual metals and compare them to known data to see which to see how they match up and that and through that we can uh, we can see what the metal is that we've uh, that we've been dealing with and we can analyze it and identify it quite simply. So that is atomic emission spectroscopy. It's qualitative analysis allows us to identify things based on the visible light released through atom excitation and de-excitation.